is this. If you type in evolution to Google, these are the images that come up. That's linear thinking. That's not tree thinking, right? This is a very poor representation of how evolution works. Different hominid lineages did not replace each other in a linear sequence. That's not how evolution works. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures later that, that shows a more accurate representation of the different hominid uh, lineages. So, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you approach somebody that's really worried about science? Well, the first thing is just try to get them excited about it. Just say, man, this stuff is really important. This is why you should care about this. Um, this evolution is one of the most important scientific discoveries in anything in science. I mean, the, the thing I think it's closest in representation to is Copernicus's idea that, hey, the sun is the center, right? All the planets revolve around that. That's what we call a paradigm shift. Before him, Everybody's like, no, nah, we're the center. You know, we're number one, right? Everything revolves around us. Talk about changing your viewpoint on things. That just totally changes how you have to think about things. And evolution did the same thing to biology. And as I mentioned, evolution really has been accepted in science completely since the 1900s because of the overwhelming evidence. Now, why did it take that long? Because that's when we finally figured out how genetics works. In Darwin's time, he knew that there was something that was heritable material, but didn't understand exactly how it worked. And how they typically thought it worked kind of had some problems for evolution. But once they cleared that up, microevolution was fine. But again, even then, they thought, oh yeah, the macroevolution stuff makes sense. And evolution really is the kind of the by natural selection, the unifying idea that, that links all of biology together. And here's a famous quote by Theodosius Zabzanski. Nothing in biology makes sense except in a lot of evolution. Meaning, if you really want to understand anything in biology, to com completely understand it, you have to think about how it got there. And you can't just look at it and how it exists today. You have to put it into an evolutionary context. All right. Then, you have to say, okay, here's science, here's theology. Science has to be based on facts. We can't just make things up. We, we have to go out and collect data, test our hypotheses. And that's the other thing. Our hypotheses have to be falsifiable. Okay? So we're really putting a, an onus on ourselves to, to, to be critical, to think critical. Religion is based on belief system. And it cannot influence our biology. Biology would not, any science would not progress very far if it was simply based on what you believe. You know, I mean, it'd make our jobs a lot easier. You know, every time I ran into the fall, I was like, ah, I think it's that, let's go get it. You know, but it, it, unfortunately, it's just not that easy. Um, and even if we can't explain something today, that means we just have to wait for the technology to improve to give us the tools to be able to test hypotheses. We don't just give up and make something up. That's, that's, uh, an important thing. The other thing that I think really uh, impresses people is uh, I say, hey, science has limitations. Science has to be based on testable data. We can't disprove supernatural, anything that's supernatural. I mean, if somebody believes something completely, it doesn't matter how much data you throw at them, how much rational thought you throw at them, it's just not going to work. I mean, I always give the gremlins moving the furniture in my office. You know, as soon as I shut the door, they move the furniture around, and then when I come back, they put it back in the same place. I know that's what's happening. There's no way you can prove me wrong. As well, you can put up hidden cameras. No, 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 they know those hidden cameras are there. They can disable them, you know, and, and move things around. Well, you can sneak back at wrong times, and, you know, hidden. No, no, they, they can sense when I'm coming. You know, and there's, if, if you don't, if, if you give the thing that you're talking about, supernatural powers, there's no way to disprove it. And the other thing is, evolution is compatible with most religious institutions. So the Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, the even longer list of these. Uh, I'm, I'm an advisor for the clergy letter project, which actually kind of turns things around. It, it, in evolution week, once a year, they encourage clergy to actually do a 
sermon on evolution in their church to kind of dispel you know some of the, the uh, myths about uh, evolution and what science is trying to do um, and uh, I think it actually it does some, some good things. Okay, last thing, just quickly go through some evidence for evolution. Nothing drives me crazy. There are no missing links. You know, I mean, there's so many missing links that I don't even like the term missing link. They're transitional fossils. And these little side branches in the, the tree of life that do show us how intermediate organisms had shared characteristics of major lineages that we see today. This is Tiktaalik. This is a, a, a amazing specimen that shows us the, the uh, morphological adaptations going from lobed fin fishes, which are, are fishes, to amphibians. Okay, this is a great transitional fossil that was found oh, about a decade ago. There are a lot of examples of this. Okay, transitional fossils going uh, from <coughs> terrestrial mammals to whales, showing changes in the hippos. Okay, in, in, Here's another thing we'll talk about. Why do whales have hippos? They have legs. Okay, that's a vestigial characteristic that makes sense if you understand the evolution from a terrestrial-based organism. We can actually witness evolution in historical times. Okay? HIV evolution. The reason coming up with a cure for HIV, a vaccine for this, is so difficult is this virus as the world record mutation rate. It mutates so fast that the drugs that we throw at it, it can mutate to solve those problems. But what we've done is we've used that understanding to say, okay, yeah, we give you AZT, you can evolve resistant to that. But what if we give you AZT and this drug and this drug and this drug? And that's what we do now with treatment of, of, of HIV, is throw a bunch of drugs at it, and it makes it much more difficult for it to come up with mutations that can deal with all those viruses at the same time. So again, using evolution to, to uh, uh, inform Darwinian medicine. Same thing for bacterial antibiotic resistance. Take your antibiotics <coughs> only when you need to, right? Don't build up, you know, don't throw an ecological challenge to bacteria, okay? So that when you really need that medication, it's not gonna be effective. <coughs> A lot of people look at this and say, yeah, but those are just like, I mean, viruses aren't even really alive, right? I mean, those are just pieces of protein wrapped around nucleic acids, right? What about real animals? Well, this is a house sparrow. House sparrows are not native to North America. They were actually imported by some settlers from Great Britain. We know the original population from which these come and the characteristics as far as size and coloration of those sparrows. But once they hit the New World, they took off. House sparrows are all throughout North America. They've gone down into South America. You can find them in the Amazon rainforest, the communities in the Amazon rainforest. And the interesting thing is, where they turn up in different areas, they adapt to the local conditions. So Canadian house sparrows, big, bulky, chunky things. Okay? And that makes sense to help retain heat in those more northern climes. You go down into desert environments, you got these skinny, scrawny little ones, which are better adapted for that environment. So we know what the morphological variations starting off with these sparrows were, and now we've seen them adapt <coughs> through natural selection to these different environments. We have done some wacky things with evolution. I mean, we have taken wolves and created all of these bizarre different breeds of dogs through an analogous process, artificial selection. But instead of letting nature and ecological circumstances determine what the filter is, we've said, I want that. You know, I, I know personally, I'm mean, more like this kind of guy, but, uh, but, but that just shows you what you can do with the genetic variation that was in those initial populations. One of the most important lines of evidence for evolution, though, comes from homologies. Why do tetrapods, animals with four limbs, that are used for completely different things, the wing of a bat, the fin of a dolphin, the leg of a horse, and a mole, and a human, completely different functions, the same bones. We call these homologies. They are the same bones. It's a humerus, it's a humerus, it's a humerus because they've come from the same genes inherited from a common ancestor.
despite the fact that they've been modified through developmental genes to serve different functions via different shapes. And again, you have these homologies that extend all the way down into genetics. The biggest homology of all is the fact that this is how DNA works for all animals. This is the best line of evidence that life is what we call monophyletic. Monophyletic means a single origin of life. Because DNA works the same in bacteria as it does in humans. The code is what we call the universal genetic code for if you've got this code on, you're going to get cytosine. Okay? If you get this code on, you're going to get argument. How you make proteins from DNA works the same in all these animals. That's kind of the ultimate chemical model. My favorite examples, though, are vestigial traits. Traits that come from a common ancestor, but they're just no longer functional. Okay? They're, they're no longer maintained through natural selection, so mutations have basically made them turn kind of quirky. Okay? But there's no cost associated with it because they're not functional anymore. They're not used. So flightless birds, that's a kiwi. That's a kiwi wing right there. It would take about a thousand kiwis to make a plane of wings. Right? I mean, they're just teeny tiny little nubbin things. The only explanation for that is, well, they come from an ancestral lineage of birds that had wings. And they've been secondarily lost, and that oftentimes happens on islands. Birds that, that uh, evolved on islands, like dodos. Same thing for some of the snakes. Some of the snakes still retain remnant little legs okay? and, and pelvic girdles. I can't remember if this is the boas or the pythons. Just a little bitty nubbin. But again, that only makes both. sense. I'm sorry, which one? Both. Both, yeah. Both. Actually. Oh, both. Oh, okay. Well, that'll make it easier to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they actually have <coughs> pelvic girdles. Okay, so that's, that, again, that only makes sense if you think about a phylogenetic tree, tree thing. And humans have these as well, right? So we have a little bitty tailbone, okay? Remnants from our other great ape ancestors, that, uh, uh, or other uh, primates, that have tails. And my favorite, though, is the hair on our arms and legs. Right? When you get cold, or you get some kind of adrenaline shock, this is what happens. Hair stands up, okay? and you get goosebumps. That's because this little muscle right here, the erector pili muscle, is raising this hair. Now that could be adaptive in two ways. You know, a dog does that, it can be because it's cold. You know, a dog that's all fluffed up is cold, in cold weather is doing that to increase the R value, the, the insulation value, to separate the outside environment from its warmth, creating a space of dead air. That's what insulation is. So that's one thing is adapted. We still do it when we get cold, but most of us, we don't have enough hair, that that's not going to be functional, right? I mean, it's just, it, it happens. It's a vestigial behavior with a vestigial remnant morphology. Uh, and the same thing for aggression. You know, piss a dog off, and you know, it's going to raise up the tackles and stuff as, a, as an indication of potential dominance. That's what the <coughs> is doing here. You know, we still have that same potential as well. But again, it's a vestigial behavior. And this is the one that really uh, gets in the craw of, of, of creationists. This is the chromosomes, the karyotype, kind of the chromosome map of four great apes. Okay, so going from left to right, we have humans, uh, chimpanzees, gorilla, and uh, orangutans. And you look at the similarity through most of the chromosomes. Okay, let's <coughs> look at number two. Number two, something really interesting is that you have actually for number two, you have two different pairs of chromosomes for the chimp, the gorilla, and the orangutan. But this is the human. And if you look at the sequence of DNA represented across these four, I think this figure just shows you a couple of them. Yeah. <coughs> the blue stripes indicate, indicate the homologous genes. <coughs> you've got a match here, here, here. You know, so you've got a match across all these. So these two pair here, what's happened? These two ancestral chromosomes have simply been fused in the common ancestor of humans. So since we split with the chimps, these two chromosomes fused to make a single chromosome. If that's not evolution of our common ancestor with these guys, I don't know what is. That's just, that's spectacular. Okay. 
Yeah. 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 All right, so now the fun part. Uh, hopefully, uh, I didn't go too long. But again, I felt like I had to cram it. Good. All right, don't hit me. The Bible says so. <laughs> well, again. <laughs> That's the one I always get. No, it is. That is the one I always get, it too. And, and, you know, there are other religions. I mean, my favorite creation story comes from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Raven created all of this. Raven let all of this out of the clamshell. Mm -hmm. A cockle shell, actually. Sorry. I need to make sure I get that specific. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if people believe that, because they were born hearing that story. Why is that wrong in your story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I mean, that's not the one I really believe. Flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> <laughs> I guess pretty common when we hear all the time. Uh, I just like to get you on video uh, saying. But uh, uh, if we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Exactly. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, where you, that's where you draw a truth. Americans came from Europe. Why are there still Europeans? <laughs> Explain that. I came from my mom. My mom was good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, we come on now. <laughs> We didn't come from monkeys. We share a common ancestry with the chimpanzee. We also share a common ancestry with gorillas and a more distant relationship with orangutan. We also share a common ancestry with penis worms. You know, I mean, we're all life is monophyletic. <laughs> that's, that's the one that really gets like. um, So, I mean, that's, that's the key to understanding it's not a linear transition. One doesn't replace the other. Now, other lineages have gone extinct, right? So, for example, here are all of the transitional fossils of humans. But again, that kind of indicates that there's this linear transition. This is the most likely, and again, there are a lot of question marks here. Is there, there are oftentimes a single sample associated with some of these. But these different lineages are related to each other in a tree-like fashion, not a linear sequence of replacement. And I think, I think that is the biggest misunderstanding that people have about evolution, is that it's a linear sequence. It's not a, it's, they're not using tree things. If you can get people to think that, if you can't get them to think that, then you give up. <laughs> And there are times when you say, yeah. yeah. So aren't you just explaining how God does everything? I mean, this doesn't explain like the deeper meaning of why. You're just explaining how God does it. <laughs> Possibly. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's a, another good point I, I, I like to make to people is you absolutely could be right. And there are people that call themselves uh, theistic naturalists that basically say, hey, I, I, ev evolution is completely right. But it's just giving us a better understanding of how God operates. And depending on how much they, depending on which direction I want to go, I could just leave it at that, and, and they could be happy. And then, I, or I could say, well, well, why does God? How do you explain vestigial traits? Mm -hmm. What, what, why, why did God do that? Why did God do this? I mean, this is just when, if you want to get argumentative. <laughs> uh, well, the good thing about that question, too, is those people you don't have to worry about as much exactly. on a lot of fronts, right? Because yeah. they're accepting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of students have come to me with, with that perspective. They say, hey, do I have to choose either one? No, you don't have to. But oftentimes, <laughs> if you stay in it long enough and you start really thinking critically about things, then you, then you start getting swayed. You really start getting critical. Here's one of my favorite examples. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve in fish is, is a branch off of the vagus nerve right around the gill arches. Okay? And it wraps around the aortic arch. Okay? But it's also found in all, ant, in all mammals, 
And it, it comes off, so here we have the vagus nerve coming down. It branches off right here, wraps around this main vessel coming off the heart, then goes all the way back up the neck to innervate the muscles associated with the larynx. Uh -huh. That's why it's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It has to go back up. All man, that's how it works in all mammals, even in the most ridiculous case of the giraffe. And if you want to see a really cool video, uh, Richard Dawkins has, has got a special where he teamed up with an anatomist uh, in Great Britain and they dissected uh, a giraffe. <laughs> they dissected this out the entire length. If you're kind of weary of blood, you know, you might not want to look at it, but it's a really cool video that, that, that demonstrates this. That is a horrible design mm -hmm. for a supernatural, omnipotent being, okay? But that makes perfect sense if you think about, well, the genetics just said to make it this way. It's not the most efficient, but sometimes evolution doesn't make the most efficient pathway. I mean, if, if you hire an electrician that wants to wire your house like that, you're gonna pay a lot of extra, right? And, and actually, this is costly, too. There's more potential for damage along this link, okay? Um, nervous tissue is the single most um, costly material in, in, in animal bodies to produce and maintain. So it's, it's a daily cost as well. But until there's a mutation in the developmental mechanics that says, wire it differently, <coughs> then natural selection can't do anything about it. So, you know, I, I think it just also shows natural selection is powerful when it's given the appropriate raw material in which to work with. Um, there's a, a French biologist, I can't remember his name right now, the, hit, the quote that he has that uh, oftentimes you'll see is, evolution is a tinkerer. And it can do some really cool things when tinkering, but it can't produce the perfectly designed organism, which is what you would expect for a supernatural. You also have the thing that the hitch said about um, whenever people use that argument that you know, if, if God needed evolution, then, then why you have, what, what's the percentage that like 99% of every, every species that ever existed had to die. So, so that's, that's your, your perfect God that, that he had to kill all that, all that death just so. So, so what, like, like, you know, one... He basically got a one so, on his test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he works in mysterious ways, we can't see it. But, 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 the thing about a flood, anybody's ever seen a flood and you've looked at the records of you know, houses and stuff after a flood, it, it doesn't make nice layers. Like, okay, well, all the roofs are down here, and then we got the, you know, the second floor stuff is here. You know, floods just churn things up massively. And the fossil layer is extremely predictable. And that's another thing as well, you know, I've heard is um, evolution doesn't make predictions. And if it's not making falsifiable predictions, it's not science. But I just told you about how natural selection, if you understand the ecological fit, that's making predictions. You know, I can predict at what strata a dinosaur will be versus, you know, a trilobite. Uh, if you find a trilobite, you know, in a much more recent strata, yeah, then we got problems, right? And, and we just don't find them. And that is what you'd expect in you know, a flood type situation. How does something come from nothing? Yeah, you know, the, the, that, there's actually a couple of, of areas in which you can touch on that. One, the origin of life itself. And here's, you know, somebody posted in the group uh, uh, last week or something, you know, why, why don't people just say, I don't know? And that's one where we just don't know you. There are a lot of people that are working on that. And, and we've gotten to the point where under certain environmental conditions that we think may represent the early uh, prebiotic earth uh, as far as the amount of oxygen and nitrogen and carbon uh, and if you put sparks in that uh, in an aqueous environment you can get um, biologically important molecules okay? you can get some chains of amino acids and things like that but 
actually creating self-replicating organisms, that hasn't been figured out yet. No. But again, it's one of those things that <coughs> science, at, that, at this point, we just say, yeah, we're still working on it. We're, we don't have the luxury of just saying, yeah. It's in my book. Yeah, yeah, here, here's our single right book that, that, that shows what happened. I mean, and, and kind of as an, another kind of example of, of how science has to pr proceed just when it can, for a long time, we couldn't explain how a giraffe got a long neck. How are you going to get a mutation from a mammal that has a small neck to create one with a big neck? I mean, think about that. We, we have to make the bones longer, the muscles longer, the nerves longer, the blood vessels longer. All those things, you have to have independent mutations that are going to work in concert to get that to happen. For the longest period, we had no idea how that could happen. Okay? But now we understand more about mutations in developmental genes. <coughs> so you can have a single mutation, what's called a, a pleiotropic gene that, that affects several traits at once, and that single gene can just say, make the bone longer, make the blood vessels longer, make everything longer. Okay, so we couldn't explain it at once, now we can explain it. And, and I think in our lifetime, somebody will replicate life. Now, what they're going to do with it at that point, I don't know. <laughs> do they have to use DNA and RNA and all those good things? Um... I, I, I don't know enough about the research on that to see if anybody has tried doing it on, on some other kind of, of uh, you know, hereditary kind of based unit. Uh, I think most of this, the work is trying to, based on the same chemical properties, to replicate it as close as possible. But I don't know. Self-replication being the, the first goal of that, uh, is there any other, I, I just plain don't know, is, is there any other like a, goal for what they're doing besides, besides just the self-replication, but are they, trying, are they trying to make, you know, some global death plot? Like, what are they trying to do? No, I, I think they're just trying to figure out under what conditions it could happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the, the primary goal. Is it plausible, I read uh, that MIT professor, I don't know if you saw the uh, thing or not, but he was basically talking about how a law of enter entropy could explain it, basically the rapid heating and cooling using energy to create life. Yeah. Is that plausible? That was the other thing I was going to say. I, I don't know about that because I didn't hear that specifically. But, but entropy, the, the um, second law of thermodynamics basically is oftentimes being used against evolution. Um, the, the, the second law of thermodynamics says that nature proceeds from a state of, of order to disorder. And um, so and it's entropy. So the heat death of the universe. And, but it just doesn't hold for biological systems because the second law of thermodynamics only holds for a closed system. So meaning the universe is a closed system. Yeah, so you know, there is a general, a general pattern of order going to disorder. And so there eventually be the heat death of the universe. Um, but there are lots of, and, and, and this one I just do not understand. Because it's clear, if you just look around, things proceed from a state of low order to high order all the time. We all did it. Every person in here started off as a single cell zygote, right? And we went to two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16, 32, you know, to produce, you know, a multicellular individual. So, and that's possible because there's a continual input of energy. And that came from your mom's placenta, but in nature in general, it's coming from the sun. Okay, so as long as we've got the sun, and as long as we keep eating, we can maintain that order and increase our complexity. Um, now, I, and I don't know how that would relate to you know, origins. Basically, I mean, it would definitely have to be some kind of energy input for sure. Right. Yeah. He was just basically saying. Basically, utilizing equals mc squared, mm -hmm. how energy can uh, create matter. Yeah. Um, that just the rapid heating and cooling itself would be enough energy to spark life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the the amount of the source of energy has been proposed as far as ultraviolet radiation. I mean, you know, the, the 
planet wouldn't have had an, an atmosphere that would filter out UV, so that would be a more intense form of energy that could be <coughs> done out. Uh, volcanic heat uh, could be an, another source. So, but I don't know enough. What are your thoughts on abiogenesis? No. None. <laughs> I don't know enough about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We went from stupid to rational. <laughs> so we're talking about crocodiles. 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 Sounds like a good movie. <laughs> Shark. Well, is it beer time? Is it beer time? <laughs> <laughs> the thing that that a lot of times I hear the the stupid arguments always come back to is the whole change of kinds thing. Never seen a cat dog, never seen a crocodile. I want to I yeah, oh, see yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the crocodile come walking up out of the water with feathers on it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so you show me this, you know, I, I want to see my, my poodle have a fish fall out of its vagina and until I see that I'm not gonna believe in evolution. Yeah. That's that's what yeah. that's what they what say. Ray Comfort says Ray Comfort says that. Wow. And Ham says that. Yeah. Again, the, it's just linear thinking versus thinking. That's the problem and until people are then that's but they, they mean it and hope, I swear. They mean it. <laughs> and that's but see, that's, so a that's, but that's a I'm level. Of, that's a level of willful ignorance. Yeah. It really yes. is. Yeah. It really is. You can watch people talk to to like Ray Comfort. You can watch ex in very intelligent people explain to him in in kindergarten terms very complex things. They just bounce and, off. and he, well, he, there's there's times to where I think that he proves that it's intentional because there's there's no way that he doesn't get it. But, but that's the argument that's always made. Now, with um, what's his name, with the, the child actor kid that falls in love, I think I think that that's not quite intentional. But yeah, Kurt Cameron. I don't think that's intentional. But um, but oh, are you talking about that movie that's coming out? God's Dead. Is he in that movie? God's not dead. No, I don't know. I tried to but. But yeah, you're not professor, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> you, you, you demand no, actually, your students. Actually, God, no, I, I bend over backwards <laughs> to not be in class. Mm -hmm. If you had a class, you might <coughs> be something different. But in class, no, I bend over backwards to be very diplomatic. And Is this what you've always wanted to get? Oh, yeah. This is <laughs> <laughs> every semester. Yeah, I just... Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say that it seems like basically what you are saying, people were blissfully ignorant, you know, about it. And, and even though you could sit down and you could explain it exactly the way you could explain it tonight, they either would refuse to believe it or they would just act like they don't understand. Um, and so because of that, I think that, you know, as I said before, you know, you can't have a debate or a conversation with somebody if you don't 